All right, so we're at chapter 21, Work and Wages. Today is Friday, October 4th, 2019. Human action. Mm -hmm. What did you think of this one? It was, um, I felt like it was like a pretty standard chapter. Um, I felt like I understood it pretty well. And nothing that really jumped out at me as being seeming odd yeah yeah seemed really straightforward economics yeah. mm -hmm. this is wage this uh i think the one thing that stood out to me the most about this chapter was um the tool that i'll use when i'm talking to people about why wages uh you can't artificially increase wages mm -hmm. it always has a cost that will inevitably be borne by the uh worker so it's like, oh, well, let's increase wages. Okay, well, you're going to have to cause unemployment. You're going to lay people off. Yeah. Like, there's a market for wages. There's a market rate. Anyway, let's get into it. Okay. One, introverse labor and extroverse labor. What is it meant by introverse labor and extroverse labor? Um, so I would, how Mizi puts it, introverse labor is something like weightlifting or um, things that you do for fun or things that you do for God. Um, and extroverse is something that you do to expect, like, return for. Which I don't agree with, actually. I think, I don't think you can put them in two buckets because I think anything you do like even if it's weightlifting or like praising God or something you're getting like that's just like investing in your your mind or your body and that's going to produce better returns in the future interesting like yeah if you spend a lot of time weightlifting or running then you're going to have more opportunities in the future to like yeah make things this the product is yourself what do you think Mises would say to you and if you'll excuse me just one moment I want to turn off something that's making you go yeah um I don't know what do you think if I were to channel Mises I think he would say that when you go to the gym or climb a mountain, as was the example in the book, mm. it's consumption. Um, and the difference is that extroversive work, labor, is done for production. So when you go to climb a mountain, you're not trying to get to the top. You're trying to climb the mountain. Yeah, so but, it's not like you could take a train. Yeah, but you're you're training your heart and your your heart heart is getting strengthened, so then that's a factor in production when you go to make something. So then it I think that would okay. be extroversive labor. Like if you're Lance yeah. Armstrong and you're training, that's work that you do. He might enjoy it, but that's work that he's doing to win the Olympics or whatever he did. So is that extrovert? Like he's producing like a product that, you know, people are watching him race. Yeah. I think if you're doing it for production, then it's extroversive, even if it's like enjoyable. Um, because Mises talks about the joy of labor that people can actually enjoy what they do. Mm -hmm. But still, there's a point where you're like, I've had enough. I'm going to go and do leisure time. And like, with introversive, it's just for fun. It's kind of time. Con it's consuming energy to do the work, but you're doing it. Um, it's the opposite of production, consumption, right? Yeah, I don't know. It seems an arbitrary line to me. Like the Lance Armstrong example. So, this like he, he can be doing the same activity, for instance, but. If he just happens to be on the tour, then that's production. But if he's just doing it for fun, then it's consumption. Yeah. But it's yeah. the same act. Yeah. But I, 
I think it's... So it's all, like, whatever construct you have in your head. It's not, like, a real fact. I think it's done differently, though. So if I were to project myself into Lance Armstrong, I might say that he would take a leisurely bike ride through Austin while he's not training. But if he were training, his mind would be saying, I got to push up this hill. Like, I got to go as fast as I can. Mm-hmm. I got to go around this corner tighter. Like, and it wouldn't be as, um, it wouldn't be for the purpose of his enjoyment I don't know. Maybe it is. I, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I I'm know. playing devil's advocate here, but uh, I, I think you make a good point. Joy and tedium of labor. Why does catalactics only examine extra versus labor? Comment. Modern capitalism is essentially mass production for the needs of the masses. Catalactics uh, only examines extraversive labor uh, because that is the only type of labor that's concerned with production. Mm -hmm. Why can't ideology affect the disutility of labor? Explain. Neither the joy nor the tedium of labor can influence the amount of labor offered on the market. Hmm. Why can't ideology affect the disutility of labor? There's a paragraph. The joy and tedium of labor are psychological experiences that do not affect the disutility of labor, and hence do not alter the quantities of various types of labor offered in the market. However, even though workers will still sell the same number of hours to employees in either case, they are definitely happier if they view themselves as part of being part of a benign division of labor. In contrast, if socialist or union propaganda convinces them that they are toiling cogs at the mercy of greedy capitalists, they will be miserable. Does that really answer the question, though? It states it as a fact. Well, I think it's a. This is a quote. <clears throat> the explain part. Mm-hmm. What? Why can't ideology affect the disutility of labor? I think the basic point is whether a person has the understanding that they're producing razor blades in a factory that they get to use that increases their um, like standard of living yeah. overall. And they're happy about that because they're playing a role in increasing their standard of living, mm-hmm. living and um, making it making enough money such that their wife and children don't need to work, go work in factories. Or they have the understanding that they um, are cogs in a machine, that the factory owners don't care about them, and that um, they're like just... Uh, mindless, countryless inputs into mm-hmm. a system. They're still going to have to do the the work either way. It's just the ideology is different. See, my intuition would be, in example one, they're more apt to stay and work more at that place, versus in example two, there they'll be uh, their spirit will windle. Yeah. And so they'll they'll work to work less because yeah. they don't want to put in that extra time. Mm. They like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing overtime for these greedy capitalists. They may. If you're just a cog in the machine. But I wonder if that would have an overall effect on the market for labor itself. Like, would their productivity diminish such that the market for labor is affected yeah, if that was the like the ideology of the whole market, I that think was the so. Prevailing, like, yeah, ideology. Yeah, like yeah. if if everyone has a socialist mindset, like mindset is everything. Like you could have the same hundred people, same process, same everything. But if one group's attitude sucks, then they're not going to be as good as the other people's. Mm. So maybe that's their productivity. But I would think that would also translate to the number of hours worked. 
Well, I would, I would say, okay, so I think I misunderstood the question, and I think I understand it now. The word disutility threw me off. So why can't ideology affect the disutility of labor? Well, I think the meaning there is that it's kind of unpleasant to do the work. Mm. Like, it's not something that you want to be doing. Yeah. Even if you're like, oh, I'm making razor blades for the masses, and this is great. Like, mm. we're so happy. Or even if the socialists are like, you should be happy you're working for this state government run, you know, socialist whatever thing, like you're contributing. They're still like, yeah, yeah, but I'm working and I don't like it. Yeah. So no matter your ideology, work is going to be work. Yeah, I I, just, I don't think I buy into that. Like yeah. I just like I my family is like comes from a family of like plumbers and stuff, and that's not like a glamorous job or anything but like my grandfather was really proud of the fact that like you know people had working toilets and because he built his business and would he have had that mentality if he was working at a state-run plumbing company like i don't think so i think he had that pride in his work right i think that mises is saying that regardless of one's ideology work is always going to be work Okay. Like he's always going to have to drag himself into the client's house and do the work. That is probably not what he really wants to be doing, except for for the benefit that he'll get later, the mm -hmm. the immediate gratification or the the feeling of pride. Yeah, we can go to the next section. I'm. I think it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, I don't... your commentary matters. I mean, why read the book if we're not going to right put it in. Yeah, normally context. I really agree with the, a lot of Mises' points, but these first two, I just I just feel like you can manipulate like your your thinking and mind to enjoy even like terrible tasks, like in quotes terrible tasks. I think as long as you like have the right like mental fortitude and like the right self speak like. Any task you can make fun. Okay. That's a nice attitude. I think that's good. I think it's possible, too. Like, for anyone. Yeah. Um, well, I, I feel that way. I've been fortunate in my life mostly to be working in labor of love. Mm -hmm. Wages. What do labor and commodities have in common? Uh, there's a market for each. Right. I was thinking that. How is the height of wage rates determined? How does this differ from market prices for commodities? Height of wage rates determined. Now, wages, Mises defines as different from just strict labor. I think he's talking about people like a tailor or a, a, a server who is making money based on the service that they provide. Mm -hmm. That's like, it's not just, oh, I need you to pull this lever in this factory for 12 hours and then you get this much pay. It's like, Oh, if you do an exceptional job at this, you get more or, you know, you can work more or less. There's more freedom in, in wages, I think. Right. I, I remember that part. So how is the height of wage rates determined? Um, the, it's the, the most that someone would be willing to pay that person. I, right. I mean, definitionally. How does this differ from market prices for commodities? So it's a little different because there's one labor pool, I guess. Like, so labor is like really specialized in certain things. Mm -hmm. um, so like if I go and become a plumber, then that does take me out of consideration for a lot of other positions. Mm. Even though sense. it's not like, it's like a different job, like a like commodities, like the same thing, like gold's gold, like 
but you know, if someone leaves to become a plumber, they're not going to become a doctor. So there's a lag between the time when someone changes professions um, that affects the labor market for wages. Is that what you're saying? Or have I missed the point? Um, I don't think my point was clear. Okay. <laughs> Rereading the question. The height of wages, wage rates determined. And how does this differ from market prices for commodities? I, I might say that um, commodities are more easily substituted. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, uh, I, would, I know there's a big difference between the different servers that I get in a, in a restaurant or, or the um, people that I hire um, to be a plumber or something for, versus, um, you know the mug making company. It's like basically just, I don't care mm -hmm. um, about this. This can be substituted for any other, but um, people who earn wages it's, it's um, more difficult to substitute. So the market prices I guess are more have, have a wider variance. Here's a paragraph that probably answers it. A typical objection against capitalism is that employers have an immense bargaining advantage because the workers will starve and must accept any wage offered. Yet even if it were true that all existing employees colluded to restrict wages, this would offer large profit opportunities for new entrepreneurs to enter the labor market and bid away workers with slightly higher wages. Only institutional barriers to entry, typically provided by government, can allow employers to systematically underpay workers. Hmm, that's a good point. So, if, if the greedy capitalists are, like, restricting all of the wages, like, the employees just could start their own business. There's ample opportunity. Yeah. And it's like, I think that's a, that's a really good argument for modern day when people say that, you know, people are restricting wages, but they should raise the minimum wage, but it's like, then you can start your own company. <laughs> yeah. There's opportunity. Murray Rothbard makes this interesting argument for, socialism uh in in one of his books that workers can not seize the means of production but oh just to flip the script and start to own the means of production if you work at a factory and you think it sucks get the capital together and start your own factory and then you're being a capitalist right but it's in the socialist way of Seizing the means of production. Take the means of production in your own hands and do it. Mm -hmm. Make sure. Yeah, good. Looks like our audio levels are still good. <clears throat> okay, next one. Why can't the tacit combination among the employers to which Adam Smith referred lower the wage rates below the competitive market rate on an unhampered market? Well, you just answered that right. question. They would just, they'd be undercut by new entrepreneurs. Why is it important, <clears throat> excuse me, to stress the fact that the scarcity of labor exceeds the scarcity of most of the primary nature-given material factors of production. Hmm. That's interesting. <clears throat> Why is it important to stress that the fact uh, to stress the fact that the scarcity of labor exceeds the scarcity of most of the primary nature given material factors of production. This kind of reminds me of an idea like from way earlier in the book where it's like there's never like there's never just no work to be done. Like there, at any given moment, there's like 
gold in the ground that needs to be dug up. There's like, you know, there's things that could be built. And there's the problem is there's just not enough work people to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, it seems like um, labor is needed in all um, endeavors. Like labor is a is a production cost, but mm-hmm. it's necessary in all um, production. Copper might not be. Labor always will be. Right. Why do wage rates tend toward the marginal product of the kind of labor in question? <clears throat> Why do wage rates tend toward the marginal product of the kind of labor in production? Oh, in question, excuse me. Hmm. I mean, it makes sense if I don't know you're you're working on a product with like a very high markup, like you're gonna make a high wage. Like if you're a diamond producer, and there's a really high markup, you're gonna make more than a farmer selling tomatoes. Yeah, I think again, it's the the answer is because of the market for labor. If you're not rewarded with a ton of money for doing a really good service um, that's really profitable, then some other entrant into the market is going to be an entrepreneur and say, <clears throat> "I'll buy up that labor and and pay you more." Mm-hmm. And so the wage rates tend toward the marginal product of the kind of labor in question. Catalactic unemployment. What is the definition of catalactic unemployment? Unemployment is the unhampered market is always voluntary. In the unhampered market is always voluntary. <clears throat> so I would say um, unemployment in the catalactic sense or in a in a unhampered market is when people are changing jobs and it's a speculative move on the part of the wage earner <clears throat> man my throat i'm going to need to get a little bit of water it's it's speculation mm-hmm. it's not caused by the government limiting Who can work and who can't. Right. Okay, so I think we answered this. There's always opportunities, but um, they are looking for better opportunities. Yeah. 
five gross wage rates and net wage rates what is meant by gross wage rates in what way are they important for the employer so this would be all the ben benefits like counting pension parking health insurance that would be uh gross wage weights oh i'm sorry yeah that would be gross payments right yeah that sounds correct to mm -hmm. me and um that struck me as particularly interesting because i think that's not often considered when there's the like fight for 15 or whenever they're talking about raising the minimum wage it's like well how much extra is is in the paycheck that is not seen mm-hmm is it is there any at all or is is there a lot or what you know what how much is th is there that it's not seen right and if it were seen what would the wage rate be in that case <clears throat> yeah it's really kind of messed up because it's all distorted like the wage rates are somewhat restricted but because of like the government interference and allowing like these companies to borrow all this cheap money with low interest rates and get bigger to this massive scale, it's made it really impossible. Like there's so many barriers to entry to compete with a lot of these companies. Like it's not feasible to start a new company. Because you'll have to cover things like healthcare and stuff like that. Dental yeah or whatever right yeah yeah i think it used to be that those things were offered by companies in a competitive way to mm -hmm. to steal employees away from other places and say well you'll get extra benefits and then making them mandatory put all of these hidden costs onto employers that employees do not consider to be part of their wages mm-hmm yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's just a messed up situation. Yeah, it's a little messed up, <laughs> but hopefully it's becoming untangled. Wages and subsistence. Why is the concept of the iron law of wages futile for catalactic reasoning? concept of the iron law of wages well i remember reading that but i don't remember what that is do you no but it's right here uh among its other flaws this iron law of wages was obviously false as the standard of living for the average worker continued to grow under capitalism ah in other words, population would grow until wages just barely allowed workers to buy enough food and other items to replenish their bodies for another day of labor. <clears throat> so, it's that, oh, the market for labor, that there is no market for labor, it's that employers determine that the price of labor is what will keep their workers alive. And showing up to work the next day. That's silly. <laughs> it is silly. But probably at one point, it appeared to be true. As the amount that workers were able to make just fed them. Mm -hmm. And kept them alive for the next day. They're like, oh, these damn employers, they only pay enough to keep me alive. Right. But fortunately, it seems for most of, you know, the world we live yeah. in, it's, it's it far exceeded that. It seems like wherever in like this boom bust cycle we are, like it's easier to buy into like a certain like narrative or like ideology. So sure. like, and then that amplifies the cycle with like the ide ideology like influences policies. So then like... Yes. It seems like a vicious cycle, and 
you'd think that ideology is not doesn't go in a cycle, but it definitely follows that boom bust cycle for the masses. Yeah, yeah, it seems to. Hmm. What is the reapproach of Mises vis-a-vis the analysis of the Prussian historical school? I hope this is in the study guide. Uh huh. <clears throat> the com- a comparison between the historical explanation of wage rates and the regression theorem. So if I may, I'm just going to read this paragraph. In a sense, the regression theorem explains the present purchasing power of money with regard to historical facts, namely the exchange ratios of the money good in the past when it was either a directly usable commodity itself or, in the case of fiat money, was directly redeemable for a commodity. Even so, the subjectivist theory of money, prices, still relies on the valuations made today by individuals deciding on their cash balances. In contrast, the Marxist and Prussian historical schools explain modern wage rates as directly caused by historical precedent. The current valuations of consumers and workers do not enter the explanation. If wage rates are higher in France than in China, this is because they have always been so, not because workers are more productive in France. Hmm. Seems nonsense. It it almost seems like I, I can't believe that anyone believes that. Like, is that a fair characterization? I don't know, of the Prussian. I would think I, I can imagine a person who believes all human beings are equal, yeah. and there is no reason why a Chinese uh, person should be making less than a French person, because all humans are equal, so... Right, but the thinking that wages are higher in France than China because they have been, so they'll just always be, like, you know, just France pays higher... It seems extremely short-sighted to me. Right. It makes me believe that, like, how can... I I don't know anything about this Prussian historical school, but it makes me question, like, is Mises characterizing it fairly? Uh, Well, let's try and put it into the fairest light possible. (laughs) Um, It's still... if, If it ignores the market for... Um, labor mm-hmm. and um, yeah current valuations of consumers and workers do not enter into the explanation yeah well Regardless, it seems mm-hmm. to me a more plausible explanation that workers in France earn higher wages because they are more productive. Mm-hmm. And we've seen that change because in China, they've become more productive and their wages have increased. They have a middle class now. Mm-hmm. So that's great. Why are the claims of the labor unions with regard to take-home wage rates fallacious? The claims of the labor unions with regard to take-home wage rates? What ultimately determines wage rates? The market. Oh. Hmm? The market. <laughs> I would say further the consumers. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> like, if I'm not willing to pay 
five thousand dollars for a mug and i'm like look sorry mug makers i'm not willing to pay that ultimately the consumer is the one who determines the wage rates like if i'm not willing to pay five hundred dollars to go out to dinner then the wage rates for servers is not going to be very high Mm -hmm. or it's not going to (laughs) be as high as it would be if i were willing to pay five hundred dollars for for a meal so Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the consumers are the ones who decide the wages, which is especially interesting because the workers are the consumers. In a capitalist society, the people who produce the razors are also the ones who consume them. Right. So they're determining their own wages based on what they're willing to pay for the things they produce. Okay, seven, the supply of labor as affected by the disutility of labor. How are we doing on time? Still okay. Yeah, <clears throat> we can make it through. All right. Give a short overview of the facts that affect the supply of labor. And besides the employer, who can exert social pressure on a worker? What is institutional unemployment? What causes it? This was a great chapter. How did capitalism shorten the working hours of workers? How did the proportion between leisure time and working time change? Do you want to take a stab at any of these? Yeah, I'm just kind of briefly going over the summary quickly. See if I can, ha- can have some better answers. Mm-hmm. Why does a social security tax always burden the employee and not the employer? Since I want to go through some of these and maybe you can add something Mm -hmm. a short overview of the facts that affect the supply of labor well there have to be people willing to do labor that are free uh, freely available um there are there have to be other people who are demanding a a wage rate for that thing Mm -hmm. um and they have to have opportunities elsewhere that they could do something else at a different rate right um, with different risks and benefits. Um, there have to be a, a free market for there to be... Um, well, there doesn't have to be. Yeah, there doesn't have to be a free market. Yeah. For there's always going to be a market for labor, even if there's no free market. Right, there's like a slave market. There's a slave market or a a mixed market, I guess, where it's, um, you have to pay this amount for this type of labor, which creates institutional unemployment, which is the answer to another question that was just here. Um, this one's tricky to me besides the employer who can exert social pressure on a worker. I don't know the answer to that. Oh, I mean, it could be society, it could be media, it could be anything. Mm. Like, like, what are the types that another, like, who can put any type of social pressure on you? Could put social pressure on you to pr- produce. Mm. Like, the, imagine, you know, you're the water filtration expert in your town and... Your town is really dirty water. Everyone, <laughs> they're like, not, "Come on!" Yeah, and not just the <clears throat> employer that's you know telling you to get going. It's the entire community. Right. Okay. How did capitalism shorten the working hours of workers? Oh, I loved yeah. this part where it was like, as soon as workers had enough productivity to buy free time 
by not working, but by having the ability to not need to work in order to to sustain their lives, <clears throat> they got together and demanded more free time, giving the illusion that it was their demanding it that made it so, rather than their increase in productivity that made it possible. Mm -hmm. Right. Like increased producti productivity, I think, is the answer. Yeah. Um, how did the proportion between leisure time and working time change? Well, people chose to enjoy more leisure time and less working time because they're, they're so productive during working time they can afford more leisure time. Yeah. It makes me think that like 20, 30 years out, people are going to, people are only going to work like three days a week or so. Oh, far less. Yeah. I think far less than that. Mm -hmm. I expect people to work maybe an hour a week. Yeah. But so then there's like a balance between <clears throat> like, because I think it like too much leisure time is bad for you. Why? Because you so you need to work, like yeah. I think <laughs> according I just, to whom? What? I don't, just psychologically, I think you need to go through like the pain of working, of the discomfort of working, so that leisure time is enjoyable. Like I think if you have like all leisure time. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I'm extremely optimistic in my view of man's increased productivity because, of course, Mises reminds us it can go the other way. That overconsumption and underproduction can lead to starvation. Mm -hmm. And in the case of central banking, Overconsumption has been incentivized um, for at least a century, mm -hmm. um, which has a real consequence. Right. <clears throat> and, and could result in lowering production and hence a lowering of the standard of living in real terms. Yeah, that would uh, that would be tough. Yeah. Let's hope we can stave it off. Why does a social security tax always burden the employee and not the employee employer? Um, because the employee ultimately has to pay it. It comes out of the market for mm -hmm. labor wages. Yeah, it costs more to hire someone. Yeah, they don't get to see it yeah. um, in their paycheck, but it is a cost that the employer has to pay for them, and so they get less take-home pay. Mm -hmm. Why were the laissez-faire economics uh, economists the pioneers of the unprecedented technological achievements of the last 200 years, according to Mises? What do you think? <clears throat> I, I think because of what they did to um, for labor. Mm -hmm. It's because they... He talks about the factories during the 1830s in, in London that um, even though it was the so-called Industrial Revolution, there were tons of factories that were not effective and they went out of business. And that's the laissez-faire, hands-off approach where if something's not working, like a GM, you stop doing it. You let them go out of business <clears throat> rather than keeping them alive through zombie money. Mm -hmm. And that helps the, the people um, be more productive because the, the factories that are doing the right thing get rewarded and do more of it and then make the 
people more productive, which increases their standard of living, and hence the laissez-faire economists are the pioneers of the unprecedented technological achievements of the last 200 years. Right. Wage rates as affected by vicissitudes of the market. What is the relation between innate, innate talent and wage rates? Some people just have innate talents for things. Um, he gives the example, the actress Bridget Bardot, a popular French actress in the 50s, extremely beautiful, would not have been as successful or likely not have been as successful if she weren't around in the time of movies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so she is a superstar internationally, um, earn a very high wage rate, uh, has innate talents. Right. In what ways does the uncertainty of the future affect the employee? Well, um, employers, they're uncertain about the future. They're going to be saving more capital and they're not going to be expending more in anticipation of the future. So the employee won't have as many opportunities. Yeah, that sounds right. <clears throat> the labor market. What is the definition of market wage rates? It's probably a good clean definition. Yeah. Wage rates are equal to the price of the full produce of labor. Despite Marxist slogans to the contrary, the workers cannot collectively buy the entire product, because quite simply, products are made with inputs other than labor. Aha. Uh -huh. mm. <clears throat> that's right. So the Marx... Right. The, pardon? That, that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Marxians, they want to be like, well, you charge $10 for this mug, I should get $10 for making it. And it's like, well, but there's a machine that was made, and there's the time clock or whatever, and there's all the, you know... I don't know, the tea and whatever that we yeah. provide. Or, like, there's all kinds of stuff that goes into the mug that is not just the labor. Right. The building, the lights, whatever. <clears throat> and the arrangement of all the people in the, the correct places at the right time. <clears throat> Why would workers tend to move from comparatively overpopulated areas to comparatively underpopulated areas. Well, there's more opportunities. Why did severe... What is that word? Servile? Servile labor disappear? Probably slave oh, labor. Right. It was bought out. <clears throat> the, the price that I can pay someone on an hourly wage or a daily wage is a lot better and lo at lower cost than buying the entire productivity of a human up front. Mm -hmm. If I have to pay $16,000 for somebody versus paying them $10 a day, yeah, hell, I'd so much rather buy the $10 a day person and let them be free than have to take care of them from cradle to grave and pay all of their productivity costs up front. So while I'd like to think that it was yeah, that's one's kind of conscience. Interesting way to look at it. Yeah. It's probably just economic stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's probably, it's always just about money. Yeah. Yeah. Why is the worker subject to the supremacy of the consumer. Well, the consumers vote with their money. Yeah. Consumers don't want BPA plastic anymore. Sorry, you won't get any money for making it. 
Does the hired man owe his employer for gratitude? No, it's a mutual trait. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Wow, we did it. <laughs> nice. Two chapters in one week. Well, we had some making up to do. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Chapter 22, the non-human original factors of production is coming up next. Cool. It seems like a pretty short one. Is it? Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> when shall we do it? Tuesday. You want to do it Tuesday? Yeah. Okay. What time? 8.30. All or right. Actually, I'm sorry, nine. It's because it'll one. be enough time. Yeah. Okay, that sounds great.